I'm Tannis McDonald, and I'm out here in a polar vortex thinking about the richness of our literary landscape in Grand River Country, and who gets to speak into the microphone. On this episode of Watershed Riders, I sat down with multi-talented folk artist Janice Jo Lee to talk about making art responsibly and about getting uncomfortable. Coming up next, our conversation. Welcome Janice Jo Lee to Watershed Riders. Hi Janice, so happy to be here. Janice, you are someone who gets a lot of art made in a day. So you write songs, poems, Mm. film, uh, do film and video, spoken word. You've written a one woman musical and I know you're working on another. You mentor, you teach, you do uh, administration for a national spoken word organization. And uh, really, I kind of want to know your secret, which is one reason why I want you on the show. Um, But also you and I have known each other for a long time. I was trying to calculate that I'm guessing I've known you since 2009. Is that right? I mean, when you list all the things that I create <laughs> like that, it certainly does sound impressive, but it's spread out over 365 days and there's a lot of sitting around in between. But I think that's necessary as an artist, you know, you need yeah. that empty space for yourself to have thoughts and feelings. Indeed. Um, and uh you know, it's one of the reasons why I wanted to take this back to the beginning, not so I can brag that you're my former student and you've done so awesomely, please do, please <laughs> although do. I'll do that, um, but also because I, I think the idea of a, a, a kind of generation uh, of an artist, it's, it's a mysterious process to a lot of people. And um, yeah, that's why I wanted to think about uh, those beginnings. And I think some of those beginnings for you happened outside of my site because I was teaching and you were developing um, some of your artistic sensibility with the cohort of students that you were, um, that you were working with. And I particularly remember that musical um, that in which you were, uh, there were, I think about uh, 10 young women and they were all sisters and they all sang, uh, all sang these songs. It was Female an original hysteria. Musical. <laughs> It was written by Kara Haroon, who was a UW drama graduate, and it was written as her final thesis. And it was five of us, yeah, different women playing the Harlow sisters, and it was about the invention of the vibrator, but really it was about misogyny (laughs) and feminism. Now, I think it's interesting that I remember 10 young women on stage and there were only five. Yeah. Right. Which speaks to uh, sometimes how we don't see women on stage and the fact that there's five Mm, no, I saw, I literally saw double, right? right. I, I saw an abundance of women. So that's interesting what memory does. And of course, uh, what gender does in performance too. That's cool that you remember that because it was the first role where I got to play a powerful character, like a strong character. And I think, I mean, definitely being in Laurie Musical Theater and the roles I got through as a child and in my university career, affected that as you say the generation of how I became an artist was because if I was always waiting around and auditioning for other people to give me solos give me roles it just wasn't happening tennis I don't know I mean I, even even and back then I was like is it because I'm not white if I was white would you cast me in the lead role but I'm like cute Asian so you're gonna play this weird girl who holds a ladle around and you know so that female hysteria was the first show where I got to play like a cool character, a strong woman character. And it was really fun for me. So do you remember when we met up, you had graduated and we met up at that protest, I think it was like 2017. And you said to me that you had just had a birthday and had turned a certain age. You can reveal that if you want, but I won't. Uh, you just <laughs> turned a certain age and all you wanted to do was make stuff. Not get angry, not get distracted, just make stuff. I do remember that. I remember uh, one of my poet elder friends, Jamal Jackson in Ottawa, saying that to me, that he's tired of crying, he's tired of being angry, he wants to just do things. And I think that that speaks to where I was in my healing journey. You know, like that transition from, to me, the transition from being a, a youth to an adult is when you completed your process of grief of understand when you finally see that the world is not the way that you thought it was right so a lot of young activists and I was one of them 
we go through this process where, you know, we were told that if we worked hard, we could succeed. We were told that, you know, multiculturalism culturalism exists in Canada, but then you go through the university and you learn about the world or you just go out and live in the world and you see that actually the world is a horrible place or there's a lot of injustice in the world. Because living in Kitchener-Waterloo was actually quite harmful for me. Um, the kind of racism and white whiteness, white ignorance, white dominance, white supremacy that I was constantly challenging and people were not used to that at all. And also very surprised that it was coming from me because no one's really expecting me to be a, a, a very defiant or politically articulate person, I think, because of stereotypes. And so then, um, yeah, just dealing with a lot of that and trying to figure out how I could be an outspoken artist in Kitchener-Waterloo and not destroy myself in the process. I'm interested in the fact that you call yourself a folk artist first and how, of course, that um, has a kind of conflation with your uh, with some of the political things that, that you're trying to do, the kind of activism type of stuff that you're trying to do. So I, I think this is a, a very interesting designation to think about art that is coming from the folk. And I think uh, folk art is, is often used for painting, for visual arts and uh, for uh, music. But you seem to have spread that folk artist idea into uh, being a playwright and of course being a spoken word performer as kind of offshoots of the musical practice. And um, I'm interested in certainly thinking about those different genres and how they're part of folk art and also how folk art uh, as, as you practice has to do with making people uncomfortable. Right now you've just mentioned uh, the idea <laughs> that, <laughs> that, um, that life in Grand River country as we, as we talk it is certainly not without uh, its racisms and its prejudices and you were encountering that. So yeah, talk to me about that, especially against the idea that uh, art is often thought of as um, something whose main function is to soothe rather than to disturb. I love the word folk artist because folk means people. And it really is at my, it was my life at Laurier and the creation of the radical choir and my friends at that time that I made, we were all young people, you know, becoming educated and empowered and singing songs about social and environmental justice and then forming a community around that. And that was really the first time tennis where I felt a strong sense of belonging where I could be, all the aspects of the person that I was um, and not like um, turn down certain aspects of who I was and be accepted and be empowered. And so I, it was so formative that I became a songwriter through my community in the radical choir. And so the, the folk part is we sang for ourselves and we sang for the community from the very beginning as an artist, we were interested in like, what is exactly the songs that we need to sing at this event for this audience? What is the purpose of us being here, right? We're trying to uplift. We're trying to bring a certain kind of message about whether, whether it's nonviolence peace day or, you know, the earth festival. And so this interest in being connected to the audience and what they care about, I really think that formed how I have done all of the rest of my art creating because I am interested in how storytelling can be used as a tool to connect with people, to reflect on our own world, our own times. But yeah, as you say, to challenge people and make them uncomfortable. I think it's Lillian Allen who told me, my mentor, who's when you're uncomfortable, you know you're about to learn something. And if you're uncomfortable during a song, I feel like it's a little easier to bear because there's rhythm and melody than if someone is like shouting at you at a protest. Lillian's so great. And uh, we gave her- you introduced a, me to her actually. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We, I, I remember moving to Toronto and seeing Lillian perform uh, in the 90s and just being blown away. And one of the reasons mm -hmm. was, certainly because she's just great, but one of the things she did was she was doing her poem, uh, One Poem Town. And so I thought, 
I didn't know that you could be situated in the community and criticize it at the same time. Oh. She was the first person I'd seen ever do that. <laughs> and, and I guess I was wondering why people weren't like telling her to get off the stage or, you know, or whatever. Like I, I wondered why people right. were, were listening and loving it. And I know I was listening and loving it, but I thought that's a great possibility. I really liked that. Right. Yeah, I'm going to talk a little bit about spoken word since mm-hmm. uh, we were talking about a spoken word a tradition dubbed poetry through Lillian Allen. Um, and you know, there's been kind of all of a, all of a sudden this, um, surge in interest in spoken words since Amanda Gorman did her uh, poem at the inauguration, Mm -hmm. right? And uh, all of a sudden, uh, there's always these moments. Uh, You know, I've written and and taught poetry for years and I hear people say that they don't read poetry and then they hear Amanda Gorman and they say, I love poetry, if that's what poetry is. I mean, song lyrics are poetry, Mm -hmm. right, as well. I mean, I remember we had a similar event in Canada when Shane Coisen did his poem at the Winter Olympics in Vancouver in 2010. And there was a surge in um, interest in spoken word in Canada, for sure, and around the world. But definitely these moments, these kind of pop culture moments serve the, the form. Yeah, for sure. Because it is. It is a fringe art form, Tennis. Like, oh, don't I know it? <laughs> don't I know it? <laughs> but uh, but I want to talk about spoken word. And you, I think we were one of the first cohorts, among one of the first cohorts to go to the Bantz Center and um, and learn at the program that they were running there for spoken word performers. Is that right? I was the first year when it changed hands from Sherry D. Wilson to Tanya Evanson. Okay. Mm-hmm. So I, was, I wasn't the first cohort, no. But that was also the year um, Debbie Young, Anita Africa was on, was one of the mentors, Jean-Pierre Macoso. So it was, it, it definitely, the kind of artistic vision changed a little bit. Yeah. But I was probably the first person, I was the first person out of Waterloo Region at that time to go to the spoken word program at Banff. Um, and I'm often asked by young artists, you know, there's one thing to make art for the classroom and in, in, in a university com- community or any in, in any sort of enclosed community and then take it outside of it, to take your show on the road for the first time. Mm-hmm. And what was that like for you? Yes, because that was the beginning of a two-month tour I did. It was way too long. It's the first time I was touring out West and I learned so much about how things that were feminist and radical, and I say radical in a, in a loving and good sense, like at the edges um, in Waterloo region were also radical in Calgary and Vancouver and Victoria and Edmonton. And I was surprised actually. Um, and when, when every time I do go on tour, like on my Sing Hey album tour in 2016, when I would do specific feminist poems, like in Saskatoon and how much they would resonate and how after the, show I would just be surrounded by people who wanted to tell me their story because they heard me say share my story and it I really felt that that's a kind of reciprocity the Canada culturally across the country is quite similar and you have done a lot of work here um, and of course now nationally with Speak North in creating opportunities for other people to um, make the kinds of discoveries that you've been making about uh, spoken word as activism, spoken word um, uh, as uh, as reciprocity, all of those things. Um, so can you tell me about uh, your responsibilities for Speak North? Um, what are you doing with them? And how is this administrative role fit into, um, well, the idea of uh, a folk, uh, folk artist and the idea of community being, well, national in this case. Yeah, most independent artists are artists slash producers, right? We're also organizers. Uh, The more colloquial term is community organizer. Seeing that the stage was needed and feeling actually a strong sense of responsibility that I needed to make sure there was a stage for people to be able to share their work, especially because I needed it as well. Like if I all the events that I shared my work at, they didn't exist until we created them, you know? And so, I mean, coming to Speak North, and right now, to be honest, we're at a bit of a standstill because everybody is low capacity, not only because of the pandemic, but just the general activist blowout that uh, 
burnout that we're seeing just globally, <laughs> particularly in, in the spoken word scene in Canada. But um, yeah, so I've come back to Speak North, formerly known as Spoken Word Canada, after our devastating lawsuit in 2015. And this was before the hashtag Me Too. Right? We didn't have capacity to deal with so many young people coming into the scene with trauma and then further damaging people. So my coming back to Speak North is because like I was able to heal through the mentorship I've had with Lillian Allen and mentorship of other artists and trainings I've done um, and coming back to try and heal our national community because I feel I'm in the right place with my spirit. Like I feel capacity for generosity um, because to come to like 2015, I was so burnt out. I, I didn't, I could not listen to another person disclose to me about some actions some man did like I had no capacity so I have capacity so I've come back and that that intention is to we've incorporated for the first time and the intention is to get operational funding and kind of function similarly to the League of Canadian Poets but for spoken word poets and to have be an art service organization so that we can make spoken word series across this country more sustainable a lot of it is just as you say administration writing grants um, and ha having pr production support on the back end. So I'm working on it, but it's very hard. Plus, there's a huge reckoning right now, of course, with anti-Black racism. Yeah. And Spoken Word has for sure uh, pushed out Black artists out of this form that they created in this country. Right. So mm -hmm. I'm glad you've mentioned capacity. I think that's really important. And something that isn't talked about much when we talk about writing and art. It's like boundaries. Oh my yeah. gosh. Learning about boundaries and knowing how to say no. Like that was the main reason I destroyed myself in Kitchener Waterloo is I could not say no. And people felt entitled to me, Tannis. Yeah. Like, oh, no, Janice I'm is the one person who's going to speak out about this. So we'll make her do it. And then I, and if someone's like being harmed or there's some oppressive thing going down, like I'm like, of course I'll be there. But then you, you know, don't sleep, eat, and take care of yourself, and you destroy yourself. One of the challenges is that um, that people in the community come to think that you are the go-to person for, you know, name the issue, you know, to speak out, uh, you know, against racism, to speak out against classism, to speak out against sexism, and then all of a sudden you're like, isn't there anyone else who can do this? Surely there is. Yeah, right? and you know, I, because there are so many other people who have come up and and do so much work in the in Waterloo region now. And I'm so glad. I've heard you uh, do spoken word for many years, but I'd like you to share a sample, of course, with our listeners. Do you have something oh, you can yes. do for us? For our listeners. I have a new piece. I wrote it for Mashed Poetics. Uh, it's a show out of Vancouver. They, it was the 49th edition of Mashed Poetics. And it's a show where poets write poems in response to songs. So there was 10 different poets and I got to be one of them. And this is the piece that I wrote. Bapri bapri bap. What about this? What about that? Going on a journey through my memory book in my brain. Chapter four, chapter 12, chapter 10. Ooh, ooh. Remember this time when I went to the gym? I hated that running on a treadmill, looking at the TV. No way, this ain't right. Let me go outside. Walking on the trail, walking on the trail. Look at that dog. Look at its tail. Oh, wish I could pet that dog. Wish I could hug that dog. Ooh, hello, soccer players. Can I play with you? I swear I'm good. Remember that time? Remember when we biked to the lake shore? And I put in the water Lake Ontario. Ew, ew, I don't care. I'm going in. Don't drink it in. Ooh, the water's so refreshing. Oh, oh, bobbity bobbity bop. Going through my memories. Look at that time when I didn't like you, when I didn't like my life. I didn't want to do the things I got to do. I walked into the kitchen, dishes everywhere, and I started to cry, cry. I don't want to do it. Someone else do it. Sad, sad. I was so sad. Remember that time? Everything was bad. Those years ago, it's everything is bad again i miss my friends when will this end getting jerked around when will this end when will this thank you <laughs> oh, the end <laughs> speaking of burnout right <laughs> that covid angst um, part of the playfulness of that piece uh, reminds me of uh, of the beginning uh, or the beginning of um, 
part of your uh, one person musical, Will You Be My Friend? And I think it's time to talk mm-hmm. about that show. I know that this may be uh, the a piece of work that you are best known for uh, in KW and, and uh, outside of KW as well, because of course, oh, I like that. Yeah, because of course you, uh, Will You Be My Friend had three runs here, I think. Yes. Right, three runs in Kitchener Waterloo. I saw two of them, and of course you had a, a three-week run at Theatre Past Marais in Toronto as well. Yes which was quite a coup and good for you. So I want to talk about um, this idea of developing Mm -hmm. uh, not only a play, but a one person play. And of course we'll add the music to that as well. So really there's, there's plenty of layers going on here and plenty of challenges. Mm -hmm. I want to hear a little bit about your work uh, with green light arts and how they helped develop what was your vision and Mm -hmm. Yeah, and make it uh, make it live on the stage. Yeah, when I came to Will You Be My Friend, it happened because I performed a piece at the Arts Awards and Matt White and Karen Lowerson had moved back to KW from being Toronto theater peeps. And afterwards, Matt White came up to me. I hadn't met him. And he was like, I really liked your performance. I'd love to work with you. And I was like, who are you, white man? I don't even know who you are. You know, so eventually we like went for coffee and he's like, are you working on anything? And I was like, well, I want to write a musical, but I was always doing a thousand things and had no intentions of actually sitting and down and writing it like that week or anything. And so in conversations, we came to some ideas and I, I, want, I was interested in this idea of friendship. And the first thing I wrote was this long manifesto, like 20 pages, I think, called Janice Lee and the White Supremacy Smackdown. And that was the initial title of the play. And it was just like spoken word, polemic rant about all the problems I had with racism and whiteness. And especially in Waterloo Region, you see a lot of kind of white savior mentality, a lot of like nonprofit complex. And I was directly criticizing people I knew, criticizing institutions in my community because this is this Canadian way of being is we think we have multiculturalism and we think that we're good and we think we're not racist, but we're just polite about it. We don't talk about residential schools or, you know, we don't, Canadian style racism is peacekeeping to not talk about it and to not disturb the waters, but it's all under there, under the surface. So I wrote this long monologue thing. And then I was like, I don't really just want to go on stage to do a long monologue. How can I make this more theatrical? And eventually through workshopping it in the rehearsal room with Matt, came to this character of Dr. West, who is a clown, essentially. And he presented this science. And this is kind of where like my Capricorn self was coming in, like the science of friendship. You know, how many times a week do you need to hang out? How far is too far? How close should you live? You know, what... And, you know, should you make sure there's always snacks? You're trying to think about the factors, the literal concrete factors that make up a friendship. Because I was always interested in hanging out with people more than they were interested in hanging out with me. So I wanted to put that in. So when we came to Dr. West, then the play started to fall into place and a structure fall, falling into place. Like he's presented this experiment about how a human of pigment a.k.a. a person of color, a racialized person, could succeed in the world by pretending to be more white. And that's like the this, this satire on assimilation. So, yeah, we kept re- rehearsing it. And Matt would be like, oh, we need a song here or a scene here that bridges this to this. And then I'd go home that night and write it. And I'd bring it back the next day. And he's like, okay, that's perfect. And then we'd continue onward. And we had many people come in and give us feedback, actors from the empty space, other artists. Um, And then between each production, each uh, presentation, we would go back into rehearsal and and tweak it. Yeah. I read the most recent version of the script, and I noticed that in it, Dr. West is described as a bully Mm -hmm. underneath his surface niceness and earnestness. Uh, And I was a little surprised because when I was watching you perform Dr. West, uh, I was in some ways fooled by his niceness and his earnestness, or at least fooled by the the clown persona that suggested that. Yeah. Um, But 
as I read through version four, it became quickly clear to me how much you have been pushing the idea of the bully even more into, into that version four. And I, I wondered if that was a function of um, the version that you uh, revised in order to go to Theater Pass Mirai, or was this just a beam in my eye that I couldn't quite see it mm. until um, it was named for me in the script? Mm -hmm. uh, there, more the latter, yeah. I was never, I never made huge changes to Dr. West. I mean, if I had replaced the word bully with manipulative, maybe that would make more sense to you, make yeah. me be as less surprising because he is charming and likable. And that's part of the trap. The whole play is a trap, right? Yeah. Will you be my friend? It sounds so much more fun than Janice Lee and the White Supremacy Smackdown. And that was part yeah. of the strategy of yeah. changing the title. It's like, we want nice white people to come, right? And then they get lulled into a sense of like security. Oh, Dr. West is so funny, but he's, he's a Buffon clown, right? He's a satire and he's actually a white supremacist. He yeah. says like, you have to integrate into whiteness to succeed and yeah. erase your own, you know, ethnicity and culture, but definitely. And the, the manipulativeness is, is this idea of like how we culturally are socialized into just like casually socialized into wanting to assimilate into white culture right um yeah and then by the end you see dr west actually making his interns put um apply violence to some of the characters it happens off stage but the whole time he's manipulating everything and that's part of the the turn of the play um, I'm interested in the transfer of uh, the play from its um, from its Kitchener um, milieu, in which you make uh, Kitchener specific references mm -hmm. and um, even Kitchener specific jokes mm -hmm. uh, and Kitchener specific satire uh, to Toronto, which is of course uh, a larger theatrical market, um, much more uh, you know, much more diverse in terms of, of population and uh, a very much larger population. So uh, what happened when you, did you keep oh, the Kitchener specific changed. stuff? Nothing changed? Yeah, well, there was a huge difference, I will say, in the audience in Waterloo and Toronto. In Waterloo, I was almost always performing to mostly white audiences and they were mostly uncomfortable. They were uncomfortable through a lot of it. And only if there were certain people in the audience, whether they're people of color or my friends, who are laughing out loud at the jokes, the racist jokes, would the audience then feel permission to laugh along? There were nights in Kitchener where I could feel the audience freezing and backing mm -hmm. away because they knew I was talking about them. And there was this reckoning happening in the yeah. audience and I could feel it. And then in that, in the intermission, Matt would come backstage. He's like, I, and I'm like, Matt, I don't want to do it. They hate it. And he's like, no, Janice, you just have to, you just have to give more. I know you're tired, but you actually have to just like reach them. I was like, okay. You know? Really? It was, it was that bad? Like you didn't want to do the second half? There were a few shows that were like that for sure. Wow. Um, and whereas in Toronto, Janice, it's the first time I was performing to mostly audiences of color. Yeah. Like, there was like, our, we had, you know, we do a survey and most of the people who came to our Toronto show were young people of color between the ages of 20 to 30, you know, which is like the hardest demographic to get into the theater. Yeah. You know? So they were laughing along with all the jokes because they got it. It was their experience. It's like, oh, that happens to me. I want to hear a little bit from uh, Dr. West since we were, were parsing his, his forms of aggression and bullying and manipulation. Um, can you give me a, a piece of Dr. West? For you, tennis, no problem. All right. Uh, this is when, in, it's early on in the play, when Dr. West is, uh, he speaks directly to the audience and he, he's showing them their first kind of um, experiment candidate. And he pulls someone out from the audience and brings them on stage. And it's ideally a white man. Variable number one, medium tall, non-threateningly good looking, well-intentioned yet rather clueless, and severely dehydrated, pale, male, 
human, a potential friend for our subject, a potential mate. This make of creature is found all across the Earthian planet, a viral organism consuming and depleting resources in one area, then expanding and colonizing another, most often by terminating the original inhabitants. <laughs> Very effective survival strategy. I like it. Driven by a core value that paleness is superior to pigment, pale male humans have created successfully an earthian narrative that all humans ought to strive for pale approval, which is seen as a neutral and ultimate standard and work towards complete pale integration. Our candidate has been chosen for its completely average and mediocre qualities. Qualities which through earthian narrative have been dictated as the most desirable. Note this pale, patchy, pink skin, a reminder of the comfort an embryo feels in the womb. The disheveled hair and beard combination, which makes the human seem wild, like a hunter, gatherer, provider for the survival of the species. And the eerily strange blue as if within this human's eye is the entire Earthian planet controlled from when this, within this marvelously mediocre and average mind. Thank you. I saw you trying to do a mic drop there. <laughs> Excellent. Um, yeah. You know, it's, it's one of those, those things that's, um, it's different watching you do it when you don't have the green glasses on mm. and your, and your um, little uh, ears that, that would go up, the alien eyes. So um, I want to ask about something else about the show. Mm. Um, I, I want to talk about gender and queerness in the show, if I, mm -hmm. if I may. I was really uh, struck by the fact that you had some really gender inclusive uh, language there that um, the character of Janice is always searching for a friend, capital F friend, mm -hmm. and sometimes a mate. You just said the word mm -hmm. mate is Dr. West, but never actually for um, someone that is named as male, not a boyfriend, not a husband, right? So friend or mate. And uh, at one point there is um, uh, some dialogue between Janice and her friend uh, Layla, who says, why, you know, why are you dating these white guys why not date these, you know, uh, have hot dates with rad women of color? Like that's, you know, part of your, part of Janice's problem is uh, pursuing the, uh, these, these white guys who are unsympathetic. Um, so I guess I wanted to know why you kept um, the narrative focusing on these, well, those male, pale male humans, right? And not thinking about uh, a dating pool that was different. Yes, a few things. Um, when Layla says that in the play, Jen Ice then says, there, I am friends with all the queer rad women of color in KW. And it was true. And if I opened Tinder, there would only be like 10 or so profiles before they would run out because they're just demographically we're not as populous in the region. Um, the queerness aspect yeah, I wish there could have been more of that in the play. Um, well, it's for another it's for another production, right? Exactly. Yeah. Well, and I also thought too that by having uh, Mike and the character of Mike just kills me. I I did a spit take when I read that Mike had described himself as us poor people. Um, yeah. <laughs> That's just about died, right? poverty that activists do. Uh, I remember during um, your survey, the uh, there's an act break survey, and I think it was the question, "How white are you?" White Is that the question? benefit survey. The white benefit survey. And I remember um, looking at it and thinking, this is definitely a white benefit survey, but it's also a white benefit survey that focuses on the middle class, right? Mm. So uh, there was Mike talking about, you know, going up to the cottage and canoeing mm -hmm. all over the place. And I thought, this is very middle class, right? Yeah, this because, yeah, like race and wealth go together, right? As you say, race and class. Um, and I think I kind of make that assumption that everybody knows that. 
like that generally white people are more wealthy than people of color. You were talking about how um, people of color were laughing. And then of course, people of color felt uh, outnumbered by, by the white people and were afraid of white people's anger in, uh, as a kind of um, response to the play. So there you are sitting in front of all of this not only doing the performance, but also doing uh, the talk back. How, was, uh, how were those kinds of moments for you? I thought the talk back was essential um, for the audience to hear, uh, particularly in Kitchener-Waterloo, that my experience was not unique to me because other people of color in the audience would then confer that they've had a similar experience. So then white people in the audience would be like, oh, it's not just Janice. But definitely questions like that one you brought up are about looking for the exits. That was, those were concerning because I am taking for granted that no one is going to physically attack me from the audience. If it does happen, I do, I feel like I can pr- fight back and other people in the audience would help or, you know, my stage manager would run on and things. But we do take that for granted in Canada that the threat of physical violence is not as real as it is in the United States. Being uncomfortable is acceptable, but being unsafe is not, right? And so maybe if this play was to happen again, that we should actually have security guards. I don't know. Mm. Maybe. I know that you have some future projects going on. You are um, uh, most of the way through working on um, an album you call Ancestor Songs. I do want to tell people that Will You Be My Friend, we are working on it right now, back in rehearsal, to record it as a radio play for Midtown Radio. So that's coming up. So it'll come out as an album. Amazing. Uh, Yes, the Ancestor songs, I've been writing them for five years. There are all the songs coming out of my healing journey. These are the songs that I have built my own mythology around. Um, we we're talking at the very top about having time and space and emptiness as an artist and how that's necessary for thoughts to seep out. Like if you think of a, you need to create a blank canvas in your room or an empty space in your life so that you can then see your thoughts and your feelings and put them in front of you. And then, um, and so musically to me, that's like silence. How can I have silence? Um, an emptiness so that a melody can seep out of my body, right? Um, And a lot of that was staying home and not going to all the community events um, and not getting engaged in the latest political controversy in in town or whatever, and really focusing on my artist process. So the ancestor songs are melodies I feel when they come out of my body. I'm I'm like, wow, that doesn't even feel like I wrote that. It feels like that's a melody that my ancestors created and they put it in my blood memory and now they're giving it to me because I'm ready. You know, this is the mythology Mm -hmm. behind the ancestor songs. And they have a, I really feel like it's a, it's a real landing in the center of what my music is. So I think uh, it's time for you to sing a little. We've been talking about your songwriting and and I feel like I've been keeping our listeners from, uh, from your, uh, your singing voice. So you're going to sing an ancestor song for us, right? This is Swim Forever, and it's all in Korean. Thank you. 
내리는 바다는 떠오르고 내 몸속 비는 강물처럼 성급하게 휘두른다 우리 모두 바다 행성에 떠다니는 사람들 너는 수영할 수 있니 영원히 수영할 수 있니 감사합니다 Awesome. So beautiful. Wonderful to hear. And uh, I'm very much looking forward to being able to access the whole album uh, eventually. Um, and yeah, I want to ask you one thing about these ancestor songs. If you could have these songs do anything in the world, what would they do? Make people cry. <laughs> access emotions, you know. I really, I do identify as a singer first, actually. I think that's like, I mean, that's the thing that gives me the most joy for sure. I wanted to make people feel emotions. I think suppressing our emotions and being disconnected with the way we feel is one of the biggest issues we face as humans in this world, especially in the West and in capitalism. That's my answer. It's good. <laughs> It's good. I, I think uh, I think that's right. Where would you be without feminist friends to make art with? Crying. <laughs> Sad. Yo, the worst feeling in the movement is feeling like you're alone. Yeah. And when you have feminist friends to listen and affirm your experience, especially like as femmes and women, we're always being gaslit, you know, being having our experiences invalidated by capitalism and patriarchy and society so to have people who understand your experience and have your back and support you you need that foundation to be able to go out into the world and say things that people don't want to hear or feel like your work is good enough that you want you think it, uh, other people ought to see it or hear it and definitely building that strong foundation of having feminist friends and artists and peers is essential that means that we are just about out of time and I want to thank you for coming on um, on Watershed Writers. Uh, our uh, podcast broadcast uh, video is uh, still new and uh, I wanted, I appreciated that uh, when I asked you, uh, you said yes so quickly and, is give, and you've given us such uh, an array of things to listen to and to think about. So thank you to Janice Jolie. Oh, thank you, Janice McDonald for always cultivating the poetry community and being Woo! a badass feminist. <laughs> You've been listening to Watershed Writers on a special edition of Promenade on CKWR 98.5. I'm here as Promenade Magazine editor. My co-host for Watershed Writers is Tannis McDonald. The producer is Francis Roberts Riley with technical assistance from Brendan Highmore. We gratefully acknowledge that Watershed Writers is made possible through support from the Region of Waterloo Arts Fund. Please visit watershedwriters.ca for podcasts and author profiles. Please join us again next week, Tuesday at 6 p.m. for another issue of Promenade here on CKWR 98.5 or online at ckwr.com. What?